So this is the session on privacy. Um, and if you know me by now, I'm Andrew Adams. I spoke yesterday. So we will uh, start with my uh, co-sharer um, uh, uh, of uh, initials. Alessandro <laughs> yeah, yeah. I sometimes do get people mistaking me, uh, me for Alessandro just because of the initials. Uh, I thought it was the clothes. This is the clothes. But you have three A's. Yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm triple, triple A. I'm triple. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. Yeah. So, this is a. Um, I'm going to present not the results of a study, but the infrastructure for a study. Uh, infrastructure that took the best of five years to develop. We are about to finally run it. Um, the reason why I'm presenting the infrastructure rather than results is that after spending so much time working on a probably the most complex experiment I ever tried to run, I would love to, in the in the spirit of economies of scale and academic collaboration, I would like as many as possible of you to work with the data we are about to collect if everything goes well. <laughs> the, um, the general framing of this uh, style of research, of the steam work I've been doing, started from uh, a, this quote. Um, this is a common theme that industry uses when defending data collection and data users in this context, uh, specifically as it pertains to behavior advertising. Yeah, there may be privacy concerns, people may be sometimes clipped out, but it's, it is economically good for all parties involved, including consumers. So as an economist in the last few years, I've become interested in vetting whether this is true. So I completely bypass the privacy harm, and I focus on, is there any economic benefit from this? So we started with this in mind, an experiment. And in a nutshell, the infrastructure for the experiment consists in a desktop, Chrome, and Thunderbird extensions, which participants install. And uh, we also have uh, monitoring on mobile devices. And we collect uh, rich micro-level data. Browsing behavior, searching, shopping, reading, interaction with LLMs, etc. We also run surveys, entry, midway, exit. So we combine these two data sets. And importantly, we extract three experimental conditions. In the baseline, participants see ads, and the ads are targeted. In the ad blocking, we block the ads. In the anti-tracking, they see ads, but the ads are much less likely to be targeted. We have strict privacy controls, and so we'll go back to these in a <coughs> forthcoming slide. And like I said, initially, this started five, six years ago with the idea of simply vetting claims, such as the one I presented two slides back, these claims of consumers benefit from behavior targeted advertising. So initially, the goal was simply about studying shopping behavior in the presence or absence of ads, and in the presence or absence of tracking. But then we realized that what we were creating was really an infrastructure, uh, an infrastructure for many other diverse research questions. And this is where you come in. Because like I said, after spending so much effort on this, we would like to extract as much studies as possible. So the experimental design, we start with Facebook ads. We are trying to investigate whether we can also add Google ads. Uh, participants. Uh, well, prospective participants who click on the ads land on a pre-screen pre -screen survey. If they pass certain screening criteria, they eventually are offered to get into the actual survey. On the survey, uh, we get them to install this um, Chrome extension, the Thunderbird extension, on their Windows machine, so it's Windows only. Uh, and this data then, if they successfully install, gets to our databases. Uh, we have a dashboard which allows us to monitor in real time what is happening. Uh, and uh, we also do monthly and exit surveys, and then we try to analyze it. Okay? We also have some protocols to deal with no compliance, deal with issues that participants may have. The back end infrastructure is particularly complex. So, this is uh, the, um, actually, the green disappears. From the client computer, we have a gateway at the highest college <coughs> servers, my, my college. But that's not powerful enough to actually process the data. So we move it to Campus Cloud, which is a paid service, cloud service from Carnegie Mellon. Even that is not enough to store the entire data. So we have the Peaceful Supercomputing Center, PSC, where we put data in cold storage. And then we start the analysis probably in the fall. We expect to get between uh, 
half and perhaps one petabyte of data. Privacy safeguards, we are getting in contact with very sensitive information, so we have many layers of protection. Of course, uh, it's RB approved, of course. Of course, there is informed consent, but even that is not enough because it's still very sensitive data. So one of the cool things we do, and one of the reasons why this took so long, is that we blacklist uh, um, websites where we don't want to get any information. Imagine Dropbox, uh, Gmail, uh, um, and uh, Drive, uh, G uh, Google Drive. Uh, we don't want to get anything from that. That would be way too sensitive. In addition, imagine you go to Amazon. Amazon on the top left says Peaceful 15232. On the top right says Hello Alessandro. We don't want any of the data, so we have a mechanism that when people install our infrastructure, it learns about their PII on the client, on the client, and then stops at the client level all the data PII to come to the service. And then we have several other criteria, compartmentalized databases. We have a relay system so that we don't learn the actual emails of our participants, but we communicate with them through a relay, so it's a pseudonymous. The interventions, I mentioned them earlier, okay? It, more detailed examples of the data we collect, all the URLs, all the URLs people visit. Uh, all the ads they see, not just what they click, all the ads presented to them. The HTML for many websites, shopping, Amazon, uh, search, interaction with LLMs, chatbots. We see the questions, we see the answers. We see what people click on, timestamps, etc. On mobile, we get URLs on it. We don't get the ads, we don't get the HTML, but we get the URLs. From email, we get shopping and promotional emails. And by the game, we strip away personal information. So we will know someone bought something on Amazon and how much they paid, but we don't know their address, their credit card, their email address, and so forth. And we have these surveys. So examples of what we collect and got. Here, we will know that the person went to this URL, but we would not get the, any of the HTML because we blacklist websites such as these, pharmacy websites here. We will get the URL, we will get the ad, we will not get the HTML because we blacklist uh, news media HTML. Why? It will be too much data. Here, we get all the data. We get the a, a URL, we get the search query, search results, what people click. Here, all the data. Here, all the HTML. All the, all the HTML. Like I said, we started with these questions in mind, which were essentially shopping, online advertising and shopping questions, the original framing, but they realized that this can be used for so many other questions, right? Such as, do people spend more time uh, with uh, uh, more diverse media when they see ads or when they don't see ads? Uh, do they uh, get misinformation from chatbots uh, when <coughs> there are more ads, or do they find more relevant, relevant information from chatbots? Because again, we, we get exactly what people are asking what they're getting back in terms of answers. Uh, so where are we? Uh, we, um, like I said, now three times, we put an enormous amount of work on this. By far the most complicated experiment I ever tried to run, we would like to collaborate with anyone who wants. Uh, competitive advantage of this data set. Uh, there is lots of work on online advertising, mostly on the advertiser side, so lots of data from platforms. Of course, companies like uh, Google and Facebook knows the kind of data we would have a much larger scale, but they don't share it with researchers, only with hand-picked researchers. Comscore is uh, similar, uh, larger than us in terms of uh, uh, population size. Yeah, Comscore has you know, hundreds of thousands of people. We only have 1,020 people, but we are much richer in terms of data, and we uh, have this theory experimental treatments. And to conclude, um, although there is a smaller sample size compared to these uh, other data sets, uh, it will be open to you. Uh, we are about, uh, we are testing everything. We're about to go live uh, in July. So there is still time to collaborate. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, we should talk. Yes. Yeah, this is, I would love to. this is something I wanted to do with AL several years ago that we had talked about. But like, I, I didn't want to build the infrastructure to do it. Unfortunately, we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to be, I think Tyler yesterday was the asterisk miscellaneous in his uh, <laughs> session, and so I'm going to be the asterisk miscellaneous in the privacy session, because I usually do privacy stuff, for those of you who don't know me, but um, uh, today I actually want to talk about something that we've just started, and so uh, any, any comments or, or um, 
feedback is very much welcome. I'm interested in, so uh, I, I got interested into the study of LLMs and creativity because once you've studied privacy long enough, I think that you start to think about everything as related to privacy. Mm -hmm. So the effect of, you know, the use of technology on, uh, on autonomy and in general, on freedom of thinking. So let, that led me to um, to, to, this, uh, uh, to this topic here. Uh, it's joint work with Jenny uh, Jiaping Chen um, and Anjana Susarla at uh, Michigan State. Um, so the motivation for this is basically, it came up in one of the previous uh, talks, and so hopefully this will be helpful to you guys too. Um, so the idea is that with all of these, um, you know, many tools that are now available to us, you know, AI uh, powered tools, uh, large language models, um, it's really difficult to distinguish between human generated and AI generated content. In this talk, I'm going to talk specifically about text, but you can think of this as any mode. Now we know with GPT for Omni, like you can do any kind of modality, right? Audio, video, uh, music, whatever. Um, but it's really difficult to detect AI generated content. There are, you know, some uh, people are trying to do it via watermarks, uh, which are obviously easy to circumvent. Some other people are trying to do it uh, by analyzing the statistical uh, features of uh, AI generated text. But um, as of now, we're terrible at detecting um, AI generated text and we're getting more terrible as the LLMs become uh, better and better. Um, not only uh, humans and uh, so humans are terrible at detecting AI generated uh, text, but also um, algorithms are bad at detecting AI generated text. Um, and so uh, we would think that, you know, getting us humans getting the help of an automated system to detect AI generated text would help, but it's actually even worse because um, G GPT detectors are extremely discriminatory towards minorities and specifically for the English language because most of these models are trained on largely um, uh, English language based uh, text. Uh, they're biased against non-native speakers, excuse me, non-English native speakers. And so we thought uh, we could try to do better by asking, uh, if you think about it, it's a very simple question, but um, can we find features of human creativity which are intrinsically different uh, than the creativity of something like a large language models? And so that would help us distinguish, right, human creativity from uh, AI creativity. Um, so, and, and that led us to thinking, uh, you know, at the basics of, tra uh, of transformers and, and large language models, which is how do large language models work intrinsically? And the way that they do it is obviously, <coughs> I, don't, uh, I don't need to explain to you guys, but maybe to the general public, you know, these large language models are magic creators of, you know, of uh, perfectly uh, readable text, indistinguishable from uh, human created text. But really what they are is they're just prediction models, maybe very, very sophisticated, but they just to predict what's the most likely word that's going to come after a set of words that you give it as prompts. Um, not just the next, uh, uh, the, the most likely word, but also what's the most likely sequence of words. And you can make that sequence as long as possible and blah, blah, blah. But that's what they are. They're just trying to predict the most likely word or set of words <coughs> that will come after the prompt. That, that you give it. And so this is fundamentally different from the way that we write. And here I emphasize generate text versus write, because I think that those are two very different activities. You can generate words, but the way that humans write is intrinsically different, right? So the human's way to, to write is not just predict, predicting what's the most likely thing to say after you said the first thing. And so we, we figured that it made sense to use these feature in order to distinguish something that is AI generated versus human generated. So currently what we have as detectors of uh, AI generated text is um, tools that use mainly perplexity and um, burstiness. So these are two features of text. Uh, perplexity has to do with the uncertainty of the large language model in predicting the next words or word or set of words. And burstiness has to do with the fact that uh, um, typically when, again, when large language models generate text, they try to do, they get the most likely thing uh, and then they uh, apply the same level of probability across all contexts. But in human language, we have burstiness, right? So there are some 
words that are more likely to appear in certain contexts with specific semantic meaning. And so uh, as, as you know, the, the state of the art uh, in terms of GPT detectors is something that uses, per so you can measure these things mathematically. So you can measure perplexity and you can measure burstiness. And so these GPT detectors are trying to use these features in order to distinguish one from the other. But obviously they're doing terrible because uh, you know, they tested them. Um, so um, the main problem that comes out of these prediction uh, 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 this, these predictions from LLMs is that they have this repetition problem precisely because they are trying to predict the most likely thing that you're going to say after a set of words, they're, they're going to be repetitive. So they're going to uh, create text that has redundancies in them. And you can measure that. So you can measure semantic redundancies by using some features that we didn't come up with, like we took them from, from the literature. Uh, but the, essentially they are uh, semantic distances uh, among pairs of sentences. You can do semantic dis distances between pairs of words, and you can do semantic distances between pairs of sentences. So we figured that if we do this, we will find much more similarity in, in, sort of in, in terms of semantics in uh, AI-generated text versus uh, human-generated text. So it turns out that it works, actually. And if any one of you guys is familiar with you know, uh, classifiers, you, you, you'll see how good this is. We couldn't even believe that this actually worked this well. So you can see distributions of words. Sorry, this, the pointer doesn't work. But you can see three different distributions, right? Maybe the different colors don't help you here, because the colors are terrible if you're colorblind. But uh, I promise you, there are literally three distinct distributions here. One is AI generated. One is human generated only, and one is mixed generated, which is especially useful to us because most of the work that we do nowadays is we work with the LLM. It's not like we let the LLM generate the whole thing. So it's, it's beautiful, it looks great. And so that means, I won't show you the numbers because nobody cares about F1 scores and recalls and whatnot, but we can do a pretty good job at predicting what is generated by an LLM, what is uh, generated by a human, and what is in between. Um, and so in the last minute that I have, I just want to talk briefly about what's the next step. So based off of these, you know, what are these unique features of human writing? The next step for us would be try to understand whether we can use LLMs to actually enhance human creativity. Rather than talking about fear of LLMs replacing writers, or, you know, which we don't want to uh, uh, tackle, or rather we don't want to think about, how can we make human creativity better, basically, using LLMs? And so we used this data set called the co-author data set if you're not familiar with it and you want to play around with LLMs, this is an, an excellent uh, data set. It's publicly available and it contains stories that are written by writers, not professional writers. Uh, you can do, we focus on creative writing, but there's also narratives. Um, and uh, so we're basically trying to see if uh, the use of LLMs enhances the production of uh, the quality of the uh, produced work in terms of creativity. And it turns out that it, so there are conditions under which it does, and it depends specifically on the randomness of the GPT. Randomness means the capability of the GPT to create words that are not so likely, right? So the higher the level of randomness, uh, the better the creativity. So I'll, I'll stop here. And this is my email address, by the way. That, I don't need to show you this. Uh, this is my email address in case you want to reach out to me. Ah, sorry. <laughs> ah, there. So <laughs> thank you. Just while Serge is setting up, the uh, identification of vocal stuff had a, an interesting one recently where they can, they can identify the shape of the vocal cords and throat and there is a distinct difference and that was another way of doing that. I think it has similarities to what you're doing now looking at it from a different direction and some I'm finding that yeah there is a way of identifying the AI generated stuff by looking in a completely different way than the, yeah. the than the way it's produced in the first place Okay, uh, I'm Sarah Jagelman. Um, this is a study that <clears throat> we're going to be presenting at PETS uh, next month. Um, I, I, I would tell you, you could read the paper, but we haven't actually finished the camera ready, which isn't due for another week and a half. Um, so there's actually time for your, for your comments to have impact. <laughs> um, so this is on the misuse of push notification APIs um, and how that's inadvertently, presumably, um, it pre presumably inadvertently, uh, sharing sensitive information with various third parties, which may undermine, which does undermine 
uh, claims about you know secure messaging or end-to-end -end encryption. Um, but to, to give some background explaining this, um, so push notifications, you know, on the right there's an example, these things pop up on your phone. Um, for the purpose of battery saving, so the way that this could happen, right, is the application runs constantly in the background and is pulling its server, you know, for new content, but if every app had the ability to do that, it would rapidly drain your phone. So on both major platforms, on Google, um, Android, and Apple's iOS, um, there are these APIs which are central to the OS. So there's Google Play services on Android, which is a process that runs in the background, and it manages this. So there are messages that go through um, Firebase, Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is the Android platform, and then those messages get read by Play services. And then the Play services on your phone knows which app to wake up to alert that app that you know that there's an incoming message for it. Um, does, does that make sense to everyone? Yes, great. Um, there's a similar thing on iOS. Um, there are third-party push notification APIs. Um, however, because this you need to use the platform one, um, all of those are built on top of the the, the you know the platform ones. Um, so like one signal is a popular one, Urban Airship. Um, all of those use Firebase cloud messaging, even though they're advertised as separate cloud messaging APIs. Um, and so, yeah, I sort of explained how this works. You know, either the phone, you know, a sender's phone in the case of secure messaging, it sends a message to the app server. The app server then, you know, sends that message to, to Firebase, um, which then wakes up, you know, Google Play services and instructs the phone, you know, that, that app to, to phone home and pull whatever data it needs. Um, these messages can have payloads that go, you know, this is an example from Google's documentation just showing that you can put, you know, in this, the payload of the cloud messaging, uh, messages, you know, any key value pairs that you want. And so you can imagine this is, you know, th this is why some of those notifications have, you know, the, the information that's going to be uh, presented in the notif notification um, to the user. Um, of course, you know, when you talk about end-to-end -end encryption and secure messaging, there's, there's probably a good way to do this and, and probably many, many bad ways of doing this. Um, one of the recommended ways, um, this is how Signal does it, and, I, and actually uh, 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 Facebook Messenger does a good job of this. Um, it does what's called push to, actually, uh, I might walk that back because I actually don't remember um, how Facebook has implemented it, but um, this is how Signal does it. Um, the, the payload of that message is null. Um, that it gets from Firebase Cloud Messaging, there's no information in there, but it's, it's enough to alert the Signal app to phone home and see if there are new messages for the user, and so that way it can preserve end-to-end -end encryption. <clears throat> Google has advice on how to use FCM. Um, we recommend that your app send as much data as possible in the FCM payload. Um, there is, um, to their credit, a, a sentence at the end saying if you wanted to use end-to-end -end encryption, you can use this other library, but that's kind of an afterthought. Um, and so the question is, you know, what are actually developers doing here? Um, and does this result in the inadvertent <laughs> disclosure of message contents and other metadata to third parties? And, you know, that's a, a serious issue because that allows the, the contents of communications and metadata to be uh, exposed through legal processes. So if Google is sitting on you know, this data, they might have a good retention policy, but certainly you, know, you could get a court order to, to capture this data as it comes in and, and so forth. Um, and this could be used for you know, good and bad things. Um, it could also be used by foreign governments to, you know, to use the US courts to, to get a hold of this data. And so is this happening was the question. Um, yes, I mean, the fact that we have a paper accepted and I'm talking about it, you know, we know the answer to this question, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> um, and so um, my lab has been building a lot of infrastructure over the past 10 years, um, instrumenting mobile platforms so that we can run apps out of the box and see what exactly they're doing with sensitive user data. Um, we added instrumentation to our build of Android to automatically capture all Firebase cloud messaging you know, messages and just save that to a log file. Um, and so we receive all the messages. Um, we set up you know, two phones that have different secure messaging apps and we send messages between them. Um, and then you know, um, uh, I, I'm gonna say that because um, reverse engineering is, is illegal in, in, in several jurisdictions outside the US, um, we do not do that. Um, instead, we do what, what we refer to as binary archaeology um, on, the, on the apps afterwards to actually look at how, in fact, they're invoking um, the cloud messaging APIs. Um, and so, um, as a starting point, we basically, our, our category for inclusion, 
We looked at apps that advertise secure messaging, not necessarily using the phrase end-to-end -end encryption, but you know, in their description, they say send you know, secure messages, which you know, reasonably the, the average consumer might believe then that that means that the contents of metadata are not being disclosed anywhere. So we looked at apps that make these claims about secure messaging and that they have a minimum of a million installs um, based on the Play Store. And that gave us 21 different apps. Um, one of these apps actually uh, doesn't use Firebase Cloud Messaging and does the thing where it runs constantly in the background, which requires the user granting it the permission um, to, to basically eat up all the battery. Um, we eventually excluded that one because it's not using the Cloud Messaging APIs and we fo focused on the other 20. Um, so what did we find? Well, 11 of them are, are disclosing, you know, uh, various uh, data to, the, to, to Google. So there's message contents. Um, from four of the different ones. So Skype, for instance, you know, by default, um, Skype does not do end-to-end -end encryption. You can go into the settings and uh, enable end-to-end -end encryption. However, even if you enable end-to-end -end encryption, that encrypts the payload that gets sent via FCM, but there's still metadata that is not um, encrypted. And so you could, you know, use that to, you know, reconstruct who someone talks to and, you know, build, you know, the social networks um, and so on. Um, I mean, you can, um, I guess I don't really need to go into this, um, but, but I, what I was going to say, though, is uh, the talk yesterday on uh, Facebook Messenger, um, I, I can confirm that everything was correct, <laughs> that uh, at least the version we tested that does seem to be using end-to-end uh, -end encryption correctly and is not leaking uh, any data to third parties. Um, when we initially wrote the paper, this was a theoretical threat model. Um, while the paper was under submission uh, at Usenix initially, uh, Ron Wyden then released this letter, uh, basically ac accusing the intelligence community of, of exploiting legal processes um, to Google and Apple to collect data in exactly the way that we theorized. Um, the paper was rejected from Usenix because they still thought that this is a purely theoretical model <laughs> and, 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 and told us that users should know not to, tr not to trust claims of security anyway. <laughs> so we resubmitted to PETS and it was accepted. Um, so closing, um, I wrote a long discussion section which I had a lot of fun with. Um, I, I encourage you to read. I'm actually doing an extended version now for a lawfare piece um, that will probably come out in a few months. But this is all about, like, how does this sort of thing get fixed? Um, I've been doing a lot of work in this area looking at, like, developer misuse of third-party APIs that results in many of the privacy problems that we see. And, you know, to channel Ross, um, fundamentally, I think this is an, an, uh, an economics problem because it's, it's due to mismatched incentives. You know, those who are in positions where they could, you know, identify these issues and fix them are not incentivized to do so, whereas, you know, the individual developers who are trying to make sense of all of this are not qualified um, and, and aren't really able to do what, what's expected of them. So, I'll leave it back. And Ross, who is sitting there, is yes. clapping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, how do I get out of this? I did that. Okay. Um, you can so just exit. You can just close so it. open source. This is not a matter. So, but I'm also open source data. So, the data structure, the context of that. Are you going to put everything in the deep? Like all of the servers and the code that are replicated over there? Or do you have a particular lens? I mean, see if you can learn whatever question. We'll learn control algorithms. Okay. So let's, what we learn. okay. Uh, I'm a Mac user. Uh, <laughs> hi, I'm Susan Landau. I'm going to talk to you about metadata and telemetry. This is work I've been doing for a while. I'm going to focus today on telemetry, but I'll start by talking about uh, metadata, although I don't really have to talk about metadata because Christian already gave the intro about Snowden. And so what I will say is after the Snowden disclosure of Verizon, uh, uh, the Verizon court order, uh, providing uh, call detail records of all bulk call detail records. Uh, President Obama came out and said, "Don't worry about it, folks. We're not collecting content. No worry about the content." And uh, those of us who were sophisticated knew that that was not really true. But it didn't take sophisticated people to know that. In fact, Americans in general were very upset about the collection of bulk metadata. And then a couple of years later, there was one study with uh, 550 volunteers 
that looked at the call detail records and discovered, yes, you could figure out stuff about their religion, about their doctors, about their prescriptions. You could figure out that somebody had called an abortion clinic, set up an abortion for herself, that someone else had was investigating growing marijuana at home at a time when it was illegal to do such things, and so on. Um, so what's important about phone metadata? Well, first of all, the user doesn't have control over collection of the metadata because it's needed to connect the call. Um, and the user has no real effective way to do notice and choice. And this is not just true about phone calls, or that is landline calls, or uh, mobile calls. It's true about SMS and so on. Um, with smartphones, the data is even more revelatory because, of course, it gives up information about location. Now, the data about location is actually really <coughs> beneficial because, for example, urban planners will use it to figure out how people are traveling, um, where, where there's need for more restaurants or other businesses because of where people are located, where more housing is needed. Uh, NIH, the National Institutes of Health, have been funding research in the collection of metadata, of phone metadata, because it's useful for uh, information about epidemics uh, and, and where you might vaccinate early. It's useful for information about where people move during emergencies. Uh, it's also useful to other groups of people. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a, a misnomer in the photo because it's a picture of the Stasi, and of course, location data was not available from phones at the time the Stasi folded. Um, but it's not just phone metadata. This device I'm holding uh, has an accelerometer and a gyroscope, so as I hand the phone over to somebody else, the, uh, what's on the phone is, is on the screen the right way. It has a magnetometer, so I can use the phone to walk around and follow maps. It has a proximity sensor, so when my ear bangs against the phone, uh, the, uh, I don't press buttons and disrupt my phone call. Um, and these sensors are incredibly useful. Um, that's what makes your phone such a useful device. These, the sensor data is really useful for your phone while you're using it on the phone, but the data is often transmitted off the phone. Okay, so industry collection of phone metadata is necessary for delivery of content. A software metadata, so all your devices, your laptops, your desktops, anything that is connected to the internet now reports on how the software is doing. Sometimes it reports once an hour. Sometimes it reports much more often, like several times a minute. Um, it's useful for your device working properly. That's how companies pick up that there is a problem with a piece of software. Uh, but it's not as useful uh, to you when it's reporting too often and it's collecting PII. And the, uh, the uh, Europeans have had things to say about that, not so much the Americans. Data is collected without user awareness. Indeed, controls are largely unavailable. The controls that, that we saw earlier on, uh, about privacy don't exist for this kind of data. Notice and choice is implausible because the kinds of questions you'd be asked about a piece of email, you'd be asked about each packet. Okay, imagine. Or the fact I told you just a moment ago about accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer. When I told you about accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer, the engineers in the room and some of the computer scientists figured out that, hey, my phone transmitting this data is going to tell people where I am even if I've shut off GPS. The rest of you didn't figure it out until I just told you. Okay, let alone your aunts, your uncles, your, uh, your grandsons and so on, they haven't figured it out either. Uh, location information, uh, my favorite quote about location information is, that, is from Matt Blaze and he says, uh, a conversation tells you, content tells you, tells people what you say you're going to do. Location says what you're going to do, what you are doing. So uh, there's been a lot of research on this stuff in places like IEEE Security and Privacy, in PETS, in Usenix Security. There's been some government work. The Norwegian Consumer Council did a small study uh, looking at some of this. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission looked at what ISPs are collecting. Everybody looks at collection. They don't look at use. So why are researchers looking at collection? Well, it's easy to do. You put up Wireshark, you put up anything, and you collect the data. Uh, you want to find out what's happening from device telemetry? You got to go talk to a company. And is the company going to tell you the stuff that they don't want you to hear about? Not likely. Or if they do, they do it under an NDA. Uh, you can trace collection, but what gets used runs cold, gets somewhat cold. So we tried patents. Problem with patents is it shows interest. It doesn't show actual use. Um, we did learn some things. 
So there's a lot of academic research that talks about, you can find out about people's emotions. So there are patents about finding out about people's emotions. And their patents have been largely abandoned. Okay, that turns out not to be useful for a pretty obvious reason. A 75% positive rate, correct positive rate, uh, is great. Uh, but a 25% false positive rate might be not so bad for an academic study, but it's pretty bad when you're running an app that has millions of hundreds of millions of users. It's not useful. Um, the other reason that patents are useful, and this goes to how I try to think about my research, is um, it provides government a different way to look at the problem. Okay? Government hadn't, at least the U.S. government, hadn't been thinking about patents. Uh, so there have been a bunch of academic studies that have looked at accelerometer and app activity, and they found that you could track activity and behavior, demographic information, <coughs> identity, keystroke, blogging, location tracking, mood and emotion, personality traits. Um, we used, it was mostly me, so I should say I used, sensor and phone plus each of those criteria and studied 150 <coughs> patents each. That is, I went through 10 pages of patents. Any patent that had something that looked like it was privacy invasive, I, I then looked at which patents they had relied on and which patents relied on them. So I snowballed. Uh, I did the same thing with accelerometer plus company based on previous research, that is, other papers. And I also looked particularly at Uber, eBay, and Foursquare, which have had bad things. Uh, studied a total of 2,500 patents. I did not read these entirely closely, but I think I did a reasonable job. I found interesting things. So yes, emotions were listed, but emotions were most, those patents were abandoned with one exception. There was a StubHub <laughs> patent that measured the level of a user's enjoyment. Does she dance when she's listening to the Taylor Swift concert? Does she clap and jump up madly? What is that? How are we going to price the tickets? Don't know if they're using it, but we know we have a patent on it. Found other interesting patents. Meta uses an accelerometer and other data to determine if two users are on the same form of transport. And then one of them stops using it. You know, maybe they went on the company bus, uh, they went on the company bus together, and now one of them is driving. Maybe it's someone you may know, except I went on the New York City subway as a teenage girl, and the last thing I wanted is that creep standing, I don't know which yeah, creep yeah. to point to, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the creep over there standing next to me on the subway every time. I don't want a someone you may know. Uber <laughs> patent uses sensors to determine how quickly the, uh, the, par uh, the consumer is going to get to where they're meeting, and also the consumer's physical disabilities. An IBM patent tracks people who are on call, the three people on call, to see who one, which one is sleeping and not get them. The, the call that they should go in because they're needed. Well, if wow. I'm the intern and I'm sleeping and I sleep lightly and my phone is right there, says it's sleeping, I don't want my, my hospital to think I'm not responsible. Uh, the worst one, and this comes from the Norwegian study, OkCupid okay, transmitted accelerometer, gyroscope, and magnetometer to a marketing agency. My days collected Wi-Fi access points, cell tower data, and Bluetooth properties. So some recommendations. Uh, Expected uses are fine. New uses, uh, fine. Uh, the new use is identification done for security purposes. My phone can recognize that it's me who picked it up and not Bruce, and not let Bruce open it. <laughs> uh, uses for the public good, uh, single, explicit, one-time purpose. And uh, I talk to FTC, and I'll stop here. <laughs> So officially you're doing it for ad fraud detection, which makes sense to try and infer whether the phone's part of a click farm versus in someone's pocket. But there's the different types so, of Hi, welcome. My name is Alina Nayakshine and I'm currently a professor for developer centered security at the Ruhr University Bochum in <laughs> Germany. Today I would like to talk about the communication gap between software developers and privacy experts and due to the introduction of privacy regulations, for example GDPR uh, since 2018, uh, privacy experts often communicate privacy requirements to developers and uh, developers often fail to fulfill to implement the privacy requirements and nowadays, uh, for example, at least 1,300 fines were issued for uh, violations of privacy uh, compliance and companies really do care because they really have to pay a lot of money if uh, privacy 
uh, requirements are not fulfilled uh, in the correct way. This is why we were interested in the communication between privacy experts, software developers, and also team coordinators who are often involved in this communication. And we conducted also a study to investigate the creation of privacy, uh, of privacy requirements. So how do privacy experts uh, create privacy requirements and how uh, finally developers implement privacy requirements? Uh, we conducted an interview study, it was a grounded theory method, and we invited 30 participants, uh, 10 privacy experts, 10 software developers, and 10 team coordinators to talk with us uh, with at least an experience of nine years in privacy within a company context. Let's talk about the findings. First of all, um, legal language is difficult to understand for developers. So often they ask team coordinators <coughs> to explain what is going on. Um, so very often, um, one team coordinator mentioned, very often I have to talk to them, to the privacy experts personally. So they have to explain the question in a normal language. <laughs> um, additionally, um, privacy experts complain about um, the, comp uh, the complexity between the different countries with different legislations and they have to understand and they have to know them all. So a lot of different uh, uh, legislations out there and finally developers complain, yeah, um, I have to encrypt data so it is uh, stored securely, but we were asking for privacy topics and often they just uh, don't distinct, uh, distinguish between privacy and security and they do not know the difference between privacy and security at all. So uh, we also looked at the communication and first of all, what I already mentioned was privacy experts often communicate with team coordinators instead of developers. And developers also communicate with uh, team coordinators and this is a one-way um, communication. So privacy experts just create the privacy requirements documents and then they forward them and that's it. But we also observed that sometimes team coordinators or developers can ask questions about these documents. And uh, another um, interactive communication pattern was that uh, privacy experts and developers or team coordinators can really discuss these documents. But this has not often happened. And um, developers uh, feel that uh, privacy experts often lack technical knowledge. For example, um, he's the privacy expert, is not technical, like he doesn't have the software knowledge. So how should I ask questions about this? And uh, the expert on the other side complains, um, it happened to me that I had a bit more difficult uh, exchanges in terms of negotiations because simply they did not want to implement certain issues, so the developers, just because it didn't make sense for them. And um, another expert also mentioned uh, you're always seen as the blockers. So we are telling them you have to do it in this and this way and developers will not do it. Um, so additionally, uh, there is also a lack, a lack of uh, privacy requirement verification. Um, for example, team coordinators complain they don't really know how to verify um, that some requirements were really implemented. And this is uh, really interesting because um, the experts mentioned I'm not able to verify this. I do not have the knowledge to verify this. So how can I, how can I verify this? And developers uh, complain, uh, I don't know how to verify that I really uh, implemented what you asked me for. So this is really a mismatch here. And this is why we have a, lock, a lack of common ground, a lack of common uh, language in this case. So you might think, wow, okay, we have a communication problem here, so let's solve this problem. Usually we need a common ground, so a clear protocols, um, an open and direct communication. Maybe we need a responsible person who might help out, like a team coordinator, right? So let's try this out. So this is why we also um, conducted a further study where we explored how developers implement privacy requirements. We conducted a laboratory study with th three different groups. It was a control group, uh, it was a prompted group, so in this group uh, we asked uh, developers to explicitly um, implement privacy compliant solutions. And additionally, this is the most interesting part here, we, have, we had a group where we asked developers uh, to implement privacy compliant solutions and we told them you have the option to chat with privacy experts. 
So we wanted to improve the communication and we really told them, if you have any issues during this privacy requirement implementation process, just Contact our uh, privacy experts and our, uh, our privacy expert will answer your questions. And I think the most interesting part here was <coughs> that most of the time participants were not reaching our privacy experts. So they really tried to implement solutions by their own. I'm kind of afraid of asking too much. Um, like most things, it's very much legal. Um, if you don't have the time to find parallel sources, um, then it's really difficult to understand what the state actually wants. <coughs> so often they were searching online for solutions, and even if they did not understand the solutions, they were not contacting our privacy experts to ask to explain the sources. Still, they were complaining that the sources were really difficult to understand. And um, Finally, mostly um, they only contacted the privacy experts when they finished their implementation and they wanted to, to understand, um, oh, is it really privacy compliant what I did? So, uh, but you're the expert regarding privacy topics, so I'm happy to hear your ad advice on this. So this is why I would like to have an open discussion on this topic because the issue was uh, we figured out there was a communication gap between privacy experts and developers and we also provided them a solution for this like here's the chat option you can communicate with privacy experts please ask questions and um, our developers felt like oh i don't want to burden them so um, it's my task to to complete everything so i will just ask them if this is fine or not and um, the question here is um, how to support developers with privacy implementation beyond the communication chat function, for example. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right. I don't have slides, so I don't have a set of time. <laughs> All right. I have a really tough job because I have to follow all these distinguished people and I'm standing between you and lunch. <laughs> uh, I also didn't know that asterisk was an option. Uh, but anyway, so what I'm going to do is I don't have slides. Uh, for the first half, I'm going to talk about privacy. And for the second half, I'll tell you a couple of stories about ongoing projects uh, that will tie into a whole lot of stuff that we've talked about yesterday as well as today about developers, users, business models, incentives, and so on. Uh, so let me start first with the privacy part, and uh, I'm not presenting a specific story, but telling you about, or, or specific paper, but uh, giving you some insights about the user side or, of privacy decision making that we've observed across a bunch of studies, so I'm kind of synthesizing some higher level takeaways. Uh, we just heard the word creepy, and the underlying theme behind some of this is, uh, if people find apps or things creepy or privacy invasive, why are they still using them? And if people are complaining about privacy or wanting privacy, expecting privacy, regulation is coming in, um, why do apps continue to be creepy? Right? Those, those are the things that we were trying to investigate. And I'll, I'll tell you kind of three higher level points that we've noticed in this space uh, from the user side of it. So first point, is that users have more or less resigned to having their privacy invaded. And so that's one of the reasons why people just kind of say, well, what can I do? Or, you know, yes, that's the, that's the price to pay uh, in order to get this service or this app. And so a lot of user behavior that we observe uh, or the choices that they make are not necessarily because that's the privacy choice they want to make, but it's because they feel like they don't have any other option or that's the choice that, what else can I do? Um, and this is interesting because you a lot of usable security, HCI research in this space talks about, well, just empower users, give them control, right? And what we found is that there's empowerment does happen, but that empowerment uh, what we distinguish between kind of power to do things, so users are given the power to do certain things, they're empowered, but that power to do things is embedded within a larger power over the users, 
that the provider has. So Google may give you, or, or Apple, whichever company, Facebook, Meta, may give you the power to say adjust your friends list or control the sensors. But ultimately, all of that control or that power is exercised within the larger power that the platform has over your entire data or the other things that, that um, you can do with that. So that's point number one. Point number two that we saw is because people are resigned to these things, uh, they're not necessarily also making decisions in a one-off way. So when I configure, say, privacy preferences for one app, it's not necessarily the expectations for that app that are driving those decisions. It's also transferring things from what I expect about apps in general. So I just expect, oh, that's how apps behave. They want your data for serving you ads. So this app will do the same thing. Right? So essentially, the decision making for each individual piece is driven by the larger system within which these um, decisions are embedded. And what happens with that is that normalizes things. So when people come to expect that apps will, all apps will do certain things, all apps will be privacy invasive, uh, that becomes a normalized um, uh, activity for apps to do. And that's what we theorize is that's why apps continue to be creepy, because users expect apps, apps to be creepy. Right? They, they experience the discomfort from it, but that becomes normalized. That that's how things are. There's nothing I can do about it. Um, and so app makers, developers, don't really have any incentive for apps to not be creepy if that's kind of users have internalized this. And uh, third, um, third point I will make is uh, lots of these things are not individual decisions, but ecosystem type decisions. So we should be looking at the larger ways in which these things intersect with each other. Uh, and what the usable privacy and security community has done well so far is you're just imagining this one decision, right? What's the UI, the UX to make this decision uh, usable, better, seamless, what have you. But that's not necessarily the only decision that the person is making about their privacy. It's embedded in a lot of other things. And so we should be looking at privacy decision making uh, in a more broader contextual way uh, than we currently do. So that's, those are the, um, the larger points about privacy. Now I'll tell you two stories about ongoing projects, and I'll start with a confession. Um, I read other people's emails without their consent. Uh, it's not at nothing unethical. <laughs> I just get a lot of email that is not from me, mm. but for some <laughs> other Samir Patil. <laughs> How many of you get that? Discovery. Some people, right? Okay, so over the last six years, and this is not this is after spam filtering, okay? This is stuff that shows up in my inbox. I started collecting this. Uh, so I have and I I have close to thirteen thousand of these over the last six years. Over the last six years, I've received wow. about 13,000 of these. Now, why is this an issue? First of all, it's an issue because it clogs my inbox. But these, these emails, of course, they contain some marketing things and things like that. But they contain bank transaction confirmations, two-factor pa passwords. Whoa. Somebody paid their toll somewhere, and I got to know about it. Uh, electricity bills. Uh, people's addresses and phone numbers, hotel reservations, flight itineraries, all kinds of things. Now, what can I do? With so first of all, the main thing I would like to do is to stop. So I've tried unsubscribing, uh, which is really hard, right? It, sometimes it says you unsubscribe, but I don't really know if I did. Sometimes the unsubscribe link doesn't even work. It's 404. Sometimes the unsubscribe wants me to do a two-factor authentication, <laughs> which I cannot do because the phone number is not mine, right? Uh, so I wrote a paper, so this is just one part. And then I try to email to explain, okay, this is not me. And then sometimes I get emails back saying, what do you mean it's not you? You are the one emailing us. <laughs> uh, or I can I try to uh, reset the password. Uh, yeah. Or I can take over accounts, right? If I can reset the password, I try to deactivate or delete these accounts. Many of these services let you create an account, but cannot, don't let you delete accounts, right? I especially, I really wanted to delete the Ashley Madison account that was created. <laughs> like, oh I kid you not, and I think I, at least I succeeded in deactivating it, okay? 
Uh, so, and I submitted a paper on this. It's kind of being revised. Uh, speaking of what's broken with peer review, I was told, why don't you just change your email address? Uh, so, As opposed to changing your name. <laughs> maybe, right? I don't know. Wow. But anyway, okay. So, I am done. So, if you want to hear the se second story, uh, which is about two factor authentication, you'll have to talk to me at lunch. <laughs> I was going to start up Berkeley, the building manager was Sergio, and like I remember once I got okay. to so, a family member uh, asking me to please pull the paper in the bathroom, and I don't know, 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 I will know your name, if I don't, I will just um, identify you by pointing at you. Um, thank you very much for uh, a very stimulating panel. Um, we'll start at the front, and then we'll go to the back, and then to there, and then to Bruce, so bye bye. So, brilliant panel as always. Uh, so I have uh, you know a little bit of a shameless plug, uh, and uh, you know uh, 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 just kind of like some questions for everyone. Uh, so you know, really, really appreciate your research. Like this is kind of like something that we're dealing with internally at Comcast, where like our legal team came up with this tool uh, to help developers kind of figure out their uh, privacy obligations, and it's basically a list of laws. Uh, which is really, really helpful, uh, as, as you can imagine. And uh, so we have developed a tool called Compass. And the idea is, like, this is your guide to figuring out what specific privacy and genome requirements you need to implement. And the idea there is um, the developers kind of, uh, the, one of the things, so we've been doing a lot of qualitative studies with developers internally. And what we found out is uh, developers don't want to talk to us. They don't want to talk to the privacy people. They really don't want to talk to anyone. They want to do their jobs. And they don't want to care about privacy or security or any of those things. Tell them what specific engineering requirement you need them to implement. And ideally, give them sample code so they can work off of it. So I, I'm, I'm just kind of, kind of curious about uh, when you say you're looking at verifying implementations one of the things that we are looking at is having developers kind of point us to the specific part of the code where they're implementing something, and then using, uh, I'm sorry for saying this, using LLMs to validate whether it was implemented. Um, have you thought of like looking at that kind of an approach? And I would love to see if, you know, talk offline a bit more. Yes, thank you for the question. Actually, we didn't look at this solution right now. I think this is the next step, actually, because we have to. Um, but I think the, the tough part here is to find code that is related to the requirement and to, to understand when is the requirement fulfilled. So developers really don't understand what should happen, so what should I show you? So, for example, um, if I would like to delete my um, account, I can just show, oh, it's not in the database, right? Is it in the back? Uh, is it in a backup, maybe? Did I think about this? So do I have to think about this? So they really need, I think, a list to, to, to care about and what is the step, when is the, when is the requirement fulfilled? And this is something privacy experts are not able to provide because they have not the idea of how is it technically solved. They just know what has to be done, but not how technically. So I think this might be a mismatch here as well, but maybe LLMs might, helpful, might be helpful in this. We're, we're actively doing a study on this. Um, so like one, of the, one of the problems that we continue to see is just that the developers don't know when they should contact the legal help. Um, and the, you know, the people who are, you know, the, the compliance people in the organization don't know to ask the right questions of the developers usually. Um, that assumes an organization where there are those legal resources, which there aren't in most, because, you know, in, when we're talking about apps, um, you know, the, the developer of an app with 100 million downloads could be someone in a basement or a large multinational corporation. And it's by and large smaller developers who don't have the legal resources. But anyway, um, we have built a wizard basically because um, we've been looking at this idea of checklists. Um, and, uh, you know, if you talk to a lawyer, they're going to say, well, it's nuanced. You need to talk. You need to hire a lawyer because there, you know, there's no one size fits all, which technically is true. But when we're talking about people who have no access to legal resources and don't know they should be talking to a lawyer, that that's not good advice. Um, and so the idea is we built a wizard that then generates checklists based on you know their responses to the you know in, in that wizard um, about like what laws might apply. And we're currently in, uh, doing a study on this. 
Is the visit public? Is this something that you've shared? I mean, we're actively working on the study right now. <laughs> you will share it. Yes, I will share it. it, it I, ex it's I mean, it's, yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's one of my PhD students' final chapters in her dissertation. Um, she's trying to graduate in the fall, and like the plan is to have this study <laughs> running in the next month or so. So maybe she'd want to come give a talk. Yeah, I was actually going to say, I, I want to introduce you to her, um, because I think looking at um, what you, you've been doing. The project. So it's an open source project that we have. Oh, yeah. that's cool. Okay, you two should talk off. Yes, yes. Uh, let's move on. Was this a specific follow-up to that, Jean, or, or a different? I'll, I'll, I'll let Jean come in on a very specific follow-up on that. Thanks. Uh, I am got to do a shout-out to the work of Danielle and uh, Amberie. She's not here. We did zero-shot and two-shot training of LLNs to see if they could even detect you know, sensitive code, including things like location and date of birth that was really clearly labeled. And uh, we get fairly, the, the results vary widely. And then we did the same thing with humans. We took the same code and said, can you developers say, is this sensitive, it's not sensitive? And it turns out that the more expert developers had the least agreement about what was sensitive and were wrong the most. But, you know, because I guess they're just like, oh, this can't be, I've used this a million times. I don't know why they think that, but it really surprised us because normally more education improves classification. Um, and the least expert developers had like the opposite types of failures of LLMs. Well, it's, it's the um, expert versus uh, uh, inexperienced is possibly uh, caution on behalf of the inexperienced ones. Uh, okay, so thank, thank you for that, Gene. Unless anyone really wants to come back on that, we'll move on to Simpson. Yeah, so I wanted to respond to Samir and say, I feel your pain. Um, I don't have a common name, but my email address gets a lot of mail from other people, um, many of them in India for some reason. Um, and so there are other things that one can do to mitigate this, unfortunately. You can hack into the account and change the email address, which is a really powerful tool. Um, I'm sure to see that you've done that. Um, and, Tried. And the other thing that, that works, of course, is blocking, right? So one of the, the things that I'm noticing is that as I have very old email accounts, the lists of blocked and rules keep getting bigger and bigger. This is similar to like what happens with firewalls as they get older. And so we, we actually don't have good tools for managing these kinds of access control lists. Yeah, so I can, uh, actually the paper is not just about here's what the emails I get, but here are the things that I have tried. And of course the first thing I try is to reset the password or change the email address, right? And now, this is where a lot of variation shows up. So some sites will, the email address can never be changed. Okay. Okay, or some of them will let you change the email address, but in order to do that, you have to enter the one-time code that was sent to the mobile phone of the person who for whatever reason gave the right phone number. Of course, they didn't give my phone number, which means that I cannot, I cannot sometimes change the password, cannot sometimes change the email. So to the extent possible, I was actually systematically looking at what are the ways in which I can stop it, and also what does that reveal about the security practices and privacy practices at these sites. And that's why I discover all of these uh, variations as well, right? So the other thing is I've been trying to see, can I develop certain rules or patterns so that most of this stuff gets filtered out on the server side uh, without landing in my, in my inbox? And I, again, right, that rule set becomes really unwieldy and it doesn't catch everything. Sometimes, occasionally, it catches stuff that uh, is legitimate and that goes to the misdirected inbox, so it's it's pretty complicated. This is just a quick community thing. I have a big database of this. Set email. We should talk and collaborate. Yeah. Yeah. This stuff. yeah. <laughs> So can, I just, can I just point out that, that uh, I'm a little concerned about the recording here. Um, we're technically under UK legislation. Some of the things that we are talking about doing here are a violation of Computer Misuse Act 1991. Um, Good thing we're in case of mass. <laughs>
Oh, there are also things like interviews, a job interview, timings and invitations, and important. That and the thing is, I don't know who these people are, so that I cannot really contact them. And even if I did, I'm not gonna contact 50 people a day, right? That's all I would be doing if I really started doing that, right? And so, but but I feel because somebody is missing something important here, and they have no idea, or many of these people have no idea that. And, and uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Rick knows really well, also has this problem and receives completely different kinds of emails. So she has received like, speaking of sex thing, explicit images meant for some other Emily, uh, right? And, and things like that. So uh, we are also just looking at data, comparing data sets to see what are commonalities and differences would also be a really interesting thing. Is your name the Indian equivalent of John Smith or something? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very common name in the US, uh, at gmail.com. I think some of this must be from also She's also Rick's wife, so. Some of it's also intentional where you don't want to give out your own email address, so you make up a similar email address. Yeah. Okay, so. Here, yeah. yeah. and then there, and then at the back. Yeah, I have a similar question to Samir. Did you feel some of these are kind of scam? Like, I get all these invoices from Indian spa where I went, and they sent me this invoice, and I tried to connect, contact them, and they kind of start threatening me that, no, you did go to the spa, now pay this. <laughs> no, no, there. So, the, so this is after all kinds of fields phishing spam filtering has been done, right? Yeah. So if you look at the content of these email messages, they are pretty legit. So I'm glad I have an obscure name right now. <laughs> uh, question for Lara. Uh, well, first of all, a quick question. What is the size of text you need for this to work? And my, my longer question is, I mean, an obvious response from the LLM makers is to add this type of, of more, more realism into their output. So do you have a potential counter move when they move to counter your counter? <laughs> <laughs> so the first question is we, we used um, an existing data set uh, which contains 800 and something stories. Uh, each one of those stories is pretty short. I want to say something like uh, 10, 20 sentences, wow. no more than that. So it's a, it's a pretty small data set, uh, very, uh, um, but, but, but it works pretty well. Um, and for your second question is the way that we address that was to use different uh, models to do it. We, we used it for uh, GPT 3.0 and GPT 3.5 and it doesn't make a difference at all. And the reason is that people don't adjust the parameters, tend not to adjust the parameters of the GPTs that they're given. So there are these parameters like temperature or frequency, I think it's called FP, frequency uh, penalty. and People don't adjust those, uh, tend not to adjust those. And so you, even now with the with, with GPT-4 or even with GPT-3.5, you can adjust those, but people tend not to. And so our goal would be to say, you guys should play with these parameters because they will make your story more uh, human life. I think the future GPT-6 where OpenAI is doing that as a default. So the the the... the uh, generating uh, mechanism though is still the same, right? So it's still a prediction model, right? Which makes the, the 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 generating model very very different than human writing. So as the way the, what we have observed is that it didn't change across two different types of GPTs, but it's possible uh, that it could be adjusted. And yeah, to that I don't have a counter response yet, but I still think that the general uh, uh, starting point is still the same, that these models are all about predictions, and so that's what's different. Okay, so I have, uh, let me take the two I've got in the queue, and then I'll, I'll add to the queue. So at the back there, I'm there in the middle. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Stephen. So I'm very interested in, in seeing those patents, because arguably a lot of what is in those patents 
uh, covers activities that may or may not be done by the development services for a while, depending on what you believe the Snowden documents are. So I'm kind of curious if you looked at the also the time that they were applied for and who the owners were, if it either was copycatting or if it indicates in the leak of knowledge transfer from X24 users to the private sector or something. So what I do know about the intelligence agencies is that I had three different hints that the intelligence agency, uh, that the NSA had been doing this for a while. Yeah. Um, and in no case could I quote anybody, but in each case the way they responded to me made it clear that, that the NSA had been using telemetry information for quite some time. But did you see on the data of application, people's applications were taken? Did you provide like maybe a bit of insight if it was knowledge transferring people? Um, it it seemed to me unlikely. Um, I have to go back and look at the patents, yeah. but my sense is it's unlikely that in in those cases it was coming from there because there was such a. It fit in the pattern of the types of information that that the companies were acquiring. Um, so the one about emotions was, there was one company that, that abandoned all of them, except for, StubHub was not the company, uh, that abandoned all of them, but that was, seemed to be their modus operandi of what they were looking at. They might be looking at other things too, but I, that's where I found them. But the things, uh, whether it was Meta or Uber, or it fit within a general pattern of stuff that they were looking at. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is also a question for Susan. So I was curious, it seemed like some of the points that you had, a lot of us like reacted when we read them, right? And I was curious if you had thoughts about how to have less of this going on. Is it like feeding these tips to journalists in order to get public outrage? Is this something that like, is your methodology something they could repli replicate to like find those stories? Is any part of it automatable? I was just sort of curious. Yeah. Like, so I was quite frustrated <laughs> because I haven't, uh, so the first part of the work, the stuff on metadata and notice and choice and so on, that was the slide I didn't do. Uh, Patricia Vargas Leon, who was a postdoc with me, and I published in a law review paper last fall. And after I did that, as is my want on things that have public policy implications, I had a long lawfare piece about it and then got a call from the Federal Trade Commission where I briefed them in uh, January when, and talked to them for uh, a couple of hours. Uh, and there were people from the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission there. And they are clearly interested in being much more activist on, on patent, on, on privacy, and they were taking very copious notes. Um, the, meta, the telemetry information doesn't fit the sort of standard study that the various conferences like, so I've sort of given up. I'm going to send it off to a technical journal, a technical magazine, and, and, and publish it there because I need to move on to other things. Um, and when I do that, um, I will send out mail to the usual suspects. Um, so I have uh, the law fair, so uh, this is sort of a general comment um, to everybody. Um, when I do something that is public policy oriented or I'm part of a group like the Keys Under Dermats and so on, we put something in in lawfare if we can possibly get it in because that gets read in the U.S. and Europe by policymakers, maybe in Asia, I don't have confirmation in Asia, but, but certainly in the U.S. And, and Europe by policy people. It gets picked up by journalists sometimes. The journalists often don't call me, they go and do their own papers. But that's, that's how I've been trying to, to do that one. Uh, but I haven't gotten the interest from the academic community on the the patents that I wanted because they want the study done in a they want stuff that doesn't make sense to do for it. So so I'm moving on. Okay. So uh three four. Yeah, I have a good couple of coming from the law side of things, I would say at least the impression I got from these schools was that you were giving privacy law or lawyers or privacy experts too much credit, and I think the confusion is also there. Uh, so I'll share two personal anecdotes. One is I'm working on a, on a survey of open source software and GDPR compliance, and it's very difficult to achieve, um, even when discussed in amongst traders um, agreement as to whether something A corresponds to a particular GDPR requirement and B fulfills that. Uh, the second one is sort of a, a story I'll tell, which was when I presented some empirical work to the French Data Protection Authority um, they asked me, 
is your research DDPR compliant? We're not really sure. Um, so that's an example of confusion even internally. So I, I think that's like another dynamic element of your research. Thank you so much for the comment. Actually, um, um, it's 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 tough. I think so. The question is also, would you be able to to say developers, okay, when is the requirement fulfilled? So, I think it's 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 tough. I, I think really like when you when you get an actual judicial decision about a specific product, and even that product, a specific version of that product, that's the only time legally you have a definitive answer, right? The rest of the time, uh, you, people are all incentivized on the legal side to be overly conservative, also, right? Because it costs a lawyer nothing to say. Oh, you might as well do a, do a bit more. We're not yeah, sure if it's legally protected. So, you know, in the interest of being conservative. Um, so that's, I think, another frustration yeah. that you're suffering. But the, uh, on the flip side, of course, is that, at least for companies, the incentive is to go the other way, to push as far as you go. So that's, that's part of the... Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is for search. Um, I was excited about this because this is something that bothers me, and I have been wondering how this works. Um, I don't know if I miss it or if you can say more about who you meant by third parties when you said. Like, is it just Apple and Google? And the context for this is that um, I recently made the mistake of getting a new car and connecting <laughs> my phone to it. And one of the first things that happened was that like the whole content of my signal messages was like appearing on the dashboard. Um, and I assume that they're just scraping that, but I don't know for sure. And so maybe you know. Well, I don't think the car, I mean, there's the no, you know, car interfaces like Android Auto and Apple. As the push I think it's the push notifications. Going yeah, it's just the, the push notifications. Yeah, I mean. So like, that's all, you know, all of that's running off of your phone. I mean, whether the car is then hijacking what shows up on that display and using that for yeah. your own purposes, I have no idea. I mean, that's technically possible, right? Is it a Tesla? Um, no, I mean, <laughs> most cars now have this. Um, I don't know about that. I mean, to your first question, you know, the third parties are any entity that's not the app maker, right? I mean, like... Yeah, in this specific case with the cloud messaging APIs, like those are platforms. You know, we're not talking about some like random ad tech company that's then using this data to monetize it. Um, but I mean, to most consu you know consumers who are using you know Signal or Facebook Messenger, they reasonably I don't think expect you know Google or Apple to be parties to their conversations through those apps. In fact, that's one of the reasons people use end to end encryption. Yes. So that not even the platform provider has the right. data of the content, and then suddenly the the app on the other end is sending it so that the platform, the underlying platform, yeah. gets it. Which you know, it's, it's a violation of the expectation yeah, of the yeah. users, particularly when they're selecting end to end encryption. I mean, to, oh, just to be clear, I'm not accusing Google of using this data in any you know and doing anything untoward with it. I mean, in most cases, Google. What? But they have it. So yeah, but they have it, and that means and that makes it you know subject to legal processes. I mean, in many cases, you know, again, this is because developers are improperly using the APIs. In this particular instance, it, they're doing so encourage, while following encourage, the advice on the blog, which I, I've emailed Giles, and hopefully that will get fixed. <laughs> um, but you know, Google probably doesn't know the data that they're receiving because they're not looking at it, but it's there. So I just passengers see that those messages. Yeah, are exactly. I was, yeah. I was thinking yeah. about that. My text messages. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. I just yeah. had more of an answer to Alyssa, and I wanted to finish it, which is many of you probably don't know about something called the conversation, which is in the U.S. It's um, uh, a lot of schools are uh, uh, universities are contributing money to this organization called I don't know what's behind it called the conversation, where they have professional editors and they take academic work. They have the uh, the academic write something and then they edit it. Goes up on their web page, but it's free to be copied <coughs> in entirety by any press in the country. World, world, oh, right? World, because I had something in Indonesia uh, translated into Indonesian, um, and so that is actually really great because um, as long as you can, they're they're pretty good about. I mean, it takes time because their editors, you know take your language and then they make it incorrect um, and then you have to pull it back. Uh, it takes me always three times as much time to get something out in the conversation than I think it should. But that's another way and I've had things, I mean sometimes they go to tiny presses but sometimes I've had them in the LA Times and so on. It's all online, it's not hard copy. You don't get paid for it but you're getting, you're getting out, out the message in the way that Elizabeth was asking about. 
Okay, so Ryan and then Tyler, and then I'll, I'll, I'll see some more hands up. I'll right, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this is Tyler Sandro. I'm in awe of the uh, ambition, the audacity of being <laughs> 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 like really quite Re recklessness. This is why you join the IRB, just yeah. so you can get that through. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's like planning multiple stages ahead yeah. for, for HS. Um, so, congratulations for that. I'm planning Thank to hound you for the opportunity Please. to use that as a way to test people's mm -hmm. um, digital behaviors as a function of their exposure to different real world events that wouldn't require any anything other than a survey question saying, were you aware that this event happened at this time? And seeing whether the cybersecurity behaviors are going to change after different events. I'll, I'll talk to you about that privately. Please. What I wanted to ask you was two things. One, you talked mainly about the instrument as an instrument, saying that this is going to be something that other people can use. I'm curious what, um, hypotheses you have, like what are the theoretical directions yeah. that you're interested in, apart from people's usage of LLMs and the, whether the, the, whether the division between personalized ads and non-personalized ads leads to what outcomes are you maybe yeah. interested in, so I'm curious about that. And then methodologically, can you tell us a little bit more about who are the, the participants, how do you field and recruit them, are you going to be refreshing them over time, um, how are you paying them, is this representative, is this just in the US or internationally, like this is, such a like a grand undertaking that I imagine that this is going to be a like a, a long term process of like building and refreshing and expanding this into something larger. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, uh, three points. Uh, first point. Uh, yeah, we want to make it make this available to others, um, uh, both the data itself, right? Um, so, and, and like I said. It, the data will be so much that we will not be able to start actually analyzing it until the fall. We are, we are kind of parking it in cold storage in the Pittsburgh Supercomputer Center. We only do minimal processing in real time to make sure that the experiment is still running. Um, but in the fall, we can make the data available to others. Um, point number one. Point number two. Uh, we can also make the infrastructure available to others, the code, etc. However, I have to warn anyone trying to <laughs> do this, uh, don't do it at home, in that uh, the, the, the infrastructure requires lots of maintenance. Uh, even if we share the code, which we will, it's not straightforward to actually run, replicate the experiment. Uh, third, uh, we are still in time because we, uh, we plan to go live in July to add some questions to the survey. We have limited real estate space because we cannot expand the surveys too much. But yes, we are still in time, so we'd love to discuss that. Point number two, research hypothesis. As I mentioned, we started with a, a narrow goal, the online advertising economy, and then we realized we were actually creating a platform. So in terms of platform, this is an exploratory study with no hypothesis because many possible research questions could be asked. But for our narrow initial idea, yes, we have an hypothesis, which is uh, the following. Um, several of my colleagues in the economics of privacy field has uh, have proposed, and there are rigorous empirical evidence suggests so, that privacy regulation or privacy interventions are damaging consumer welfare or the welfare of vendors because they decrease efficiency in the marketplace, matching between buyers and sellers, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, we believe that, by we I mean myself and my research team, that this may be the case, but there is the evidence is being misconstructed because it is uh, local evidence, not a, a global equilibrium. What I mean by this, uh, for instance, consider the example of publishers. Uh, studies have shown that publishers uh, earn lower revenues from uh, um, non behaviorally targeted ads than from behaviorally targeted ads. Well, yes, but that doesn't tell you, because these studies are run uh, on a specific set of publishers and focusing on specific campaigns, uh, they cannot dispel the doubt that we have that these studies are merely capturing a displacement effect. So when you make certain group of people less uh, trackable, uh, well, advertisers are going to reallocate budget somewhere else so that 
you cannot take the results of a study on a particular, particular ad campaign, <coughs> you cannot interpret it as, oh, we demonstrated the privacy technologies, so privacy regulations such as the GDPR are, are um, harming advertisers or publishers or consumers. Because what, they may, what these studies may be finding is simply uh, reallocation, uh, without realizing evidence uh, of reallocation of budget which is why, from the consumer perspective, we want to see when consumers don't see ads, or rather, when the ads are not targeted. Are they going to spend the same, uh, but through a different uh, set of merchants? Are going to spend more, less? Are they going to uh, buy from higher quality vendors, lower quality vendors? We have some complementary evidence that we presented at Y, suggesting that behaviorally targeted ads are correlated with lower quality vendors and higher prices than competing products found in search. So we want to extend on this, uh, on this line. These are the hypotheses. And the third point, generalizability. That's tricky. Um, we are uh, trying to use Facebook ads because it is convenient. We are trying to expand it to Google ads too because it is slightly less but still convenient. To recruit participants. To recruit participants, thank you. Um, we are recruiting uh, US adults who use Windows and Chrome um, and who are currently not running ad blockers. These are the key uh, criteria. Um, the, uh, we cannot claim uh, um, general, uh, generalizability to the entire US uh, internet population because of our recruiting method of Facebook ads. We are trying to think as a nice to have rather than a must have ways to um, have a more diverse population, but it is a nice to have rather than a must have because uh, we still have to finish a few key pieces to be able to run this experiment. Okay, Thanks. Tyler? Okay, so nice follow on. Uh, so my question is also for Alessandro, and uh, building on you, we're discussing your hypotheses. My question is, like, what kind of evidence do you think would be sufficient to convince advertisers that your, your hypothesis is actually true in the sense that, that because what you are, if you, if it goes the way you think it might go, you could be arguing that behavioral targeting is not effective and, and this runs counter to like generations of efforts in advertising to get more and more particular information on people. Yeah, so, so how can, do you think there is a way, like, what kind of evidence would it take to actually convince advertisers that they, that maybe there is an out, maybe there's an outcome that isn't as privacy invasive? So that's a great question. Assuming that our hypothesis slash yeah, conjecture yeah, yeah. is correct, which yeah, may not be. Yeah, I, know. Um, I believe that it would not take just one single study but a collection of studies, including studies at a macro level. And what, what do I mean by a macro level? Once again, we know from uh, microempirical evidence that um, behaviorally targeted advertising campaign have higher click-through rate, hi higher conver conversion rate than non-behaviorally targeted advertising campaign. And this is taken again as implying that, oh, you see, this works for advertisers. Once again, I see flows from an economic perspective with this argument because if all merchants switch to using these technologies, which in fact now all do, uh, it is conceivable that these merchants end up finding themselves in a zero-sum game, in a prisoner dilemma kind of game, where they are all uh, seeing nominally higher conversion, conversion rates because yet yeah, the technology works in that regard but they all remain with the same market share that they were before. So to actually um, be able to conclude that these technologies actually increase net welfare for merchants as a whole, as opposed to simply <coughs> swapping, changing winners and losers across different uh, stakeholders, you would need to provide evidence that these technologies are either increasing um, uh, Sorry? The size of the pie. The size of the pie. For instance, by reducing search cost uh, in a manner that in increases consumer spending and also consumer satisfaction, and this increased consumer spending translates into higher profits, uh, larger pie for more merchants, or, or some evidence at the aggregate level like that. And we don't have it. 
And again, I go back to my critique of my own field of research. So much good, solid empirical research in the field is confusing local results with uh, general equilibrium results. This is extremely problematic for me. But there will not, it will not be just one single study such as this that will fully convince people. It will, it will, it will have to be an ensemble of studies over time. There, I mean, there's the Upton Sinclair quote, right? You know, it's hard to get a man to understand something that his salary depends on not understanding. Like, the goal isn't to, you're never going to convince advertisers, right? Like, this is your whole industry, and it, you know, relies on this collective delusion that this is a thing of value. Uh, the goal is to convince the regulators in courts about what the truth actually is. But one of the aspects of this, though, is where is the money going in this? And actually what we're seeing, I think, is if your hypothesis is correct, is that the money is going to the advertisers, and I'm sorry for the people that are better in the audience, but that Facebook All the middlemen, yeah. and yeah. Google are the ones who are benefiting from this yeah, yeah, yeah. because they're taking a significant payment to do behavioral advertising yeah. compared to non-behavioral advertising, and that's where the money's going. Yeah. Um, so you've not only got to show that the size of the pie increases, but you've got to show that that increase is more than the cost of doing the behavioral advertising in this, in this system. Um, but again, as you say, the, one of the problems is it's going to be a prisoner's dilemma. And I, I deliberately took the last minute there to, to make my own intervention. Um, thank you very much for a fascinating discussion all about Thank you